Hi Matrix, today's lesson is going to be on uh, how we hear as well as our balance and equilibrium. Now the purpose of this video is to take all of these structures that we have learned about in the previous two videos and use them to explain how we actually hear. Now, at this point, you do need to be familiar with the structures of the ear, the outer ear, the middle, and the inner ear. Um, until you are quite familiar with these names, the explanation will be quite difficult. So spend some time going through the labels and familiarizing yourself with each of their functions. Okay, so generally you are going to be asked uh, either in a description or an explanation in an exam and a test as to how we hear. And you are going to start your explanation off with the route in which the sound waves take. Now generally these questions are sort of a story-like question. They will either be an essay or they will be linked to a specific setting where the examiner has set up a situation that you then need to apply it to. So when we um, explain hearing, we need to mention, first of all, the route in which the sound waves take. So you're going to have to mention something along the lines of the sound waves are trapped by the pinna, they are then transported down the auditory canal, and then they make their way to the tympanic membrane. Now, it is at this point that you will need to explain what amplification is. And... A basic definition of amplification is taking a sound and making it louder and clearer. Now the ear does this in a number of ways. Amplification begins with the tympanic membrane. It's a very large surface area as you can see. It's much larger than the bone that sits behind it. And what happens is as the sound waves hit the tympanic membrane, it causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate. That vibration is transferred onto the three ossicle bones, the malus, the incus, and the stapes. Now, these three consecutive bones are all attached to one another, and they bump into one another. And effectively what happens is the large surface area of the tympanic membrane, that collects a large amount of sound waves that is then passed down to the first ossicle, which is the malus, then the incus, and then the stapes. And each successive ossicle bone is smaller than the previous one. And so what this does is it amplifies the sound. Now below the diagram I have just included what a marking memo would look like, and please take note of where the ticks are located. You will notice that once the um, sound has been amplified by the ossicles, you need to mention that it is going to be transported to the oval window. Remember, we're not hearing yet. We are only amplifying the sound. Now that we have amplified the sound, we now need to look at what goes on inside of the cochlea, which is where hearing actually takes place. Now, this is a cross-section through the cochlea, slightly different to the one that we looked at in our previous lesson, um, but next to it I have included the marking memo for how you would explain hearing. And this marking memo does include um, the beginning stages of what I'd explained in the previous slide, speaking about things like the pinna, trapping um, the sound waves, moving into the inner ear canal, and then that causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate. Um, when explaining hearing, and then also explaining amplification, you can put these two explanations in together within the same um, essay. And what you could do is, if you look at the fourth bullet point here, it says the vibration is transmitted to the ordinary ossicles and the ossicles amplify. What you can do there is, is then you can go into this previous explanation about what is amplification. Now we are at the point where our um, sound waves have been amplified, they have been transmitted through the oval window, and the oval window creates waves. Now it creates waves or pressure waves in the endolymph or the fluid inside the cochlea. 
Now, if we look alongside here, there are our three canals, the scalar, vestibuli, the media, and then tympani. You will be happy to know that you do not need to know these names and their canals. I've only included them for explanation purposes. What we do need to know is how does these pressure waves in the fluid actually create hearing? And so what happens is this fluid in the top canal causes this membrane to vibrate. That membrane causes now the endolymph inside the most um, inner canal. And that then causes the organ of corti. It stimulates it. And this entire structure is the organ of corti. And this is the most important structure that you need to know in terms of the organ of corti. You need to know what it does. And effectively, it is converting pressure waves into uh, electrical impulses. Any excess sound waves that aren't absorbed and interpreted by the organ of corti will then move into this lower membrane and then into the lower canal where it will then leave through that perilymph and exit out through the round window. So if we just take a closer look at what the organ of corti looks like, continuing on with what our expected explanation should look like, we mentioned that these vibrations stimulate the organ of corti. And the organ of corti is, I will remind you, a set of sensitive hair cells that are attached to a nerve and sitting above them is a tectoral membrane. And this membrane moves backwards and forwards and it stimulates the very top tips of the hair cells and that's how you generate the electrical impulse. We then mention, and you must mention, that that impulse is then sent along to the auditory nerve and finally to the cerebrum. Now, this specific um, memo was taken from an exam question where someone had to explain about being able to hear a lion roar. You just need to fit it into whatever the exam question um, situation is asking you for. Yet again, you do not need to know the name of the tectoral membrane, the base layer membrane. You simply need um, these structures as a base point to understand the process, um, but in detail they are not needed. Now let's move on to how would you explain the change of the position of the head. So just to remind you, when we speak about the change in position uh, or the change in posture of the head in space, we are talking about the utriculus and the sacculus. Um, keeping in mind, remember that you have two, one horizontal and one vertical. Now this diagram illustrates quite well exactly what's happening inside those structures depending on the position uh, of the head or the posture of the body. So the gravity or the gravitational pull in the center photograph is simply showing a upright posture where the otoliths, if you remember, are those small little structures, stone-like structures that are attracted to the gravitational pull. And you will see that right now they are floating directly above these little hair cells and there's no movement in the hair cells. However, if you change your posture or your head in the space around you, your utriculus and sacculus will be able to um, sense this. And so if we look at this top diagram over here, it says a backward linear acceleration. That would basically mean if you are sitting still, but you are being pushed backwards, for example, on a swing. Um, when you do the backwards motion and you swing backwards, you, in terms of your head, is still, but your hair cells are bending forwards and the otoliths move forward, which is how you sense that your body is moving backwards. It's slightly different to the picture below it in that, in this instance, the head is tilting forward. So now there is a change in posture and a change in the head space. And you can see that everything is tilting forwards. Similarly, if we look at the other diagram, 
to the right up here, it says forward linear acceleration. Now, this is what you would experience when you're in a car. So you are not moving and your posture has not changed, but you can still feel the sensation of the car moving. And that is because gravity is pulling and, ex and the acceleration of the car is pulling on the otoliths and that causes the hair cells to bend over slightly. This is also slightly different to when you tilt your head back. Remember, if you're in a car, you're sitting upright and you're not necessarily moving your head. But the second picture below that is when you tilt your head backwards and this is when the otoliths and the utriculus or sacculus tilts backwards and now the head knows it's in a different position. So how would we explain this? I've just attached a little explanation below from a marking memo. And first of all, you always need to acknowledge that there has been a change in the position of the head in space. This stimulates the maculae, which is found in the utriculus and sacculus. Remember, the maculae is the receptor. This stimulus is then converted into an impulse, and this impulse is transmitted to the cerebellum. This is also, of course, linking to your previous nervous system knowledge. How does it get to the cerebellum? It moves via the auditory nerve and the cerebellum sends impulses to the muscles to restore posture. This final point is really important because often this question is a case study, it's an application question. And remember, whenever we do these kind of specific questions where it's asking what did the uh, brain do to correct the action or how did you stop yourself from falling, etc., you do need to circle back and you need to mention how it was corrected. And in this case, our muscles were coordinated by the cerebellum in order to restore our posture. And now finally, we are going to look at how do you explain a change in speed and direction. And this now links to the semicircular canals, keeping in mind that you have three of them. And remember, they're in um, right angles to one another so that um, you are able to sense a change in direction in all three dimensions. And keeping in mind that they have um, their own sensory receptor, which is found in a swollen region called the ampulla. And the receptor is called the crista. So how do we explain this? It is a change in speed and direction of movement. Remember, you always need to acknowledge that when you give a description. It stimulates the crista. Where are the crista? They are found in the semicircular canals. This is converted into an impulse, which is sent to the cerebellum via the auditory nerve. And yet again, we always end off with um, sends an impulse to the muscles to restore balance. This is slightly different because we are restoring balance, whereas our previous was restoring posture. Now, you do need to provide both of these explanations um, in detail for questions like essays that perhaps ask someone to explain how a ballerina maintains their posture and balance while spinning on point. Um, you would then need to use both of these explanations to describe how they maintain their balance, but also their upright posture. In terms of knowing all of these structures, the most important structures that you need to be familiar with um, in terms of our semicircular canals is the names of them, which is the semicircular canal, and the receptor called the crista. You don't need to know all of these other structures such as the stereocilla, the support cells, hair cells. I have included them in my explanations for order for you to have a greater and clearer um, picture of what you need to know. But it's not necessary um, for you to um, spend a large amount of time learning them off by heart. If you do mention any of these structures in your explanations, then you'll never be penalized for that. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to teach you a little bit more than what you need to know so that when you do answer these questions, you give a little bit more detail and a little bit more specific structural knowledge 
so that when you do answer these questions, you answer them sufficiently without leaving out any smaller details. Now, this topic is quite complex and you may need to query some of this with your teachers. Please do so, um, as often this particular topic um, requires a lot of revision and it's very technical.